And welcome to Mother Murder Podcaster, where we celebrate the best and the most outrageous TV movies of the 80s and 90s. I'm Lewis Jordan, a writer. Hi, I'm Katie Madonna Lee, a <laughs> filmmaker. <laughs> and today we're covering the 1988 TV movie Elvis and Me, based on the 1985 memoir by Priscilla Presley. Uh, starring Susan Walters and Dale Midkiff. Uh, and I, first of all, I just have to thank um, Priscilla for joining us uh, to My bring pleasure. her perspective. <laughs> this Anything. whole outfit is amazing. For those of you who are just listening on the uh, audio version, Katie is all done up as Priscilla. She's got the Priscilla hair. She's got the Priscilla eyes. She's got the uh, the Priscilla tan, which is like the like late sixties Priscilla tan. Yeah, early yeah, late sixties, early seventies. When mm -hmm. Elvis did come back, he was really into tanning. When he, and yeah. then you know Vegas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this kind of uh, peach colored, very very Priscilla looking. Uh, dress it's amazing it's a full Priscilla illusion um, even the lips the right lip color um, <laughs> so um, it's eyeshadow really I, could, I couldn't find the right color so I had I mixed a gloss and a and an eyeshadow together see it's just pigment like who cares <laughs> you know if it works it works um, anything for Elvis anything. yeah exactly um, so Elvis and me, um, it first aired on uh, February 7th, 1988. Um, it was the highest rated TV movie of that season. Um, part one was seen by 32 million people and part two was seen by 31 million. So they only lost a million viewers. Uh, and, uh, Katie, you have been wanting to cover this one for a while. This was one of your favorite TV movies. And then when we heard that Sofia Coppola was doing the movie Priscilla, which is based on the same book that this is, then we were like, oh, this is a perfect time to cover this movie. Um, now go ahead. Yes. yes. No, I absolutely, uh, I own this book. Um, and uh, I love this movie. I saw it when it came out. And I did think it was very romantic when I watched it. And I did look up to Priscilla as somebody I wanted to become and projected that onto my romantic relationships. Too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and yeah, no, we can definitely, I think it would be interesting to talk about, you know, how, how it looked in the eighties versus how it looks now and all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, and then we can we also both went to the theater and saw Priscilla and so we can kind of talk about the tv movie versus the theatrical movie which is the same kind of thing that we did with Blonde um yeah. and uh I think that's so interesting because you've got um when you're remaking a movie then you're always referencing the previous movie. It's always like, oh, let's recreate this moment. And everybody will say, oh, I recognize that. Or they'll be like, we're doing a totally new take on this. And, and we're not going to give you the familiar things. But uh, I don't think that Sofia Coppola was really thinking much about the TV movie when she no. was making Priscilla. And so it's just these two adaptations of the same material that are sometimes have the exact same scenes the exact same story beats but are like completely unrelated to each other it's so interesting yes. this is something that yes. you kind of only get with like tv movies and yeah and theatrical movies um yeah i highly doubt so this is what's fascinating about the interviews i've watched priscilla presley do is that she has repeatedly said she only trusts Sophia Coppola to tell her story. 
And it's almost as if the 1988 TV movie never happened, like she didn't participate in making that, even though she was, it was heavily publicized. She was on the cover of TV Guide, uh, which is on my blog. I posted all those things. She she heavily promoted that. Yeah. And I think that's interesting that she's never brought that TV movie up in interviews, like to say that, to even source that, that it was highly viewed you know it was a very anticipated tv movie yeah and it was talked about Mm -hmm. i mean because it was you know only 10 years after elvis died um only eight years after graceland opened as a museum and as a tourist attraction which i later went to uh two years later Mm -hmm. so it it was a huge deal and the because we have this kind of cultural amnesia right now with social media no one even remembers it except for the people who saw it and and had to remember it because it would never be played again. Like, you know, you had to like really tune in and watch and then ruminate over the, your GIF was, you know, a GIF back then was your memory. Like uh-huh. you would just hold on to something or if you were lucky enough to, you know, tape it on VHS, you could replay it over and over and over again. Um, yeah so for me i saw it and i remember the scene where um i i was like oh my god he picked her out he, you know and i loved them uh you know in the the when she first sees them in the in the little blue moon music plays and um i loved the scene actually i'll never forget the scene that stuck with me the most as a kid was both the bathroom scene where he gives her drugs <sighs> and she walks crawls to him because i thought god she looks beautiful i know that's horrible i was eight and i'm thinking wow she looks fabulous like (laughs) she looks gorgeous. it was just like steam and really beautiful and i was like wow what a and also i think i i love to sleep like even as a kid i was like oh i love to sleep that looks so fun he she's gonna sleep and she slept for like two days Mm -hmm. and then uh the other scene was the ending and when she's in the limo those scenes and um they showed that differently in priscilla they didn't show her taking a bath they just show her falling asleep and she's asleep for two days um and they did not they left out the ending of elvis and me the the scene that kind of really shows the parallels between the two yeah yeah no and you know i think part of it is is that um you know, Elvis and me was like a two part mini series. So they got yeah. to put in a lot of the book, but also they just have very different takes on the material and different takes on the characters and their motivations and all kinds of things. So um, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, well, this is what's fascinating to me is it seems that Elvis and me did not have the litigation issues or the, or the tension the TV movie did not have the same, at least we don't know about it, didn't have the same um, threatening emails from Lisa Marie, you know, yeah, why are you doing this to my wasn't. father? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and that book is already out there, Elvis and me, the book is already out there and so is the TV movie. So it's fascinating to me that even the Presleys have amnesia about the TV movie. Like, it, you know, it's almost like, well, if we don't mention it, then nobody knows it happened or, you know, I, I, I don't know why it's been so abandoned because people, a lot of, you know, a lot of people do love that movie, including me. I do. I think I love the ending. I do. It's so sad. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think. Um, and, you know, I'm glad that I saw I'm glad that I saw both versions of it. Um and it's so interesting that, you know, I mean, you know, Elvis is having such a moment right now with the Baz Luhrmann film and then with this film. Um, but there have sort of always been, there's been a lot of Elvis movies. Um, and yeah, I think that this is, uh, this is an important one. And uh, weirdly an example of, uh, of the, older tv movie maybe being darker and harsher than the current theatrical movie which is not something that you'd expect uh but uh especially not with blonde when we did blonde yeah 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 um so 
I'm going to give the plot summary for Elvis mm-hmm. and me, and then we can talk about the TV movie and we can talk about Priscilla and then we can compare the, the two movies. Okay. Okay. So uh, young Priscilla Wagner's family is moving to Germany um, after her Air Force officer father is stationed there. And uh, then while they're moving... Priscilla discovers that this man that she thought was her father is really her stepfather and her biological father died in a plane crash. She's very destabilized. And then in Germany, Priscilla feels lonely and isolated. And then one day in 1959, 14 year old Priscilla meets this officer who invites her to a party at Elvis's house because Elvis Presley, who is the biggest rock star in the world, um, was drafted into the army and stationed in Germany. And so at first it looks like 24 year old Elvis is uh, sort of trying to manipulate Priscilla into having sex with him. Like he's like, oh, let's go upstairs. Um, But then he decides that they shouldn't. And uh, then soon this uh, Priscilla is seeing a lot of Elvis and they're dating and she falls in love with him. And uh, the parents are not happy about this at all. They're like, what do you want with our 14 year old daughter? Um, And it seems like Elvis has fallen in love with her too, but he also doesn't treat her very well. Um, Like, even though he promised Priscilla's parents to personally take her home after their dates, he instead said each time says, no, I'm going to have Dennis. Who's like his friend slash employee take you home instead. And then one night Dennis almost rapes Priscilla. And then when Elvis finds out, he makes a big show of beating up Dennis, but he never acknowledges like that. He was the one who put her in danger and put her in that situation himself. So Priscilla's stepdad puts his foot down and refuses to let her see Elvis anymore. But Elvis like fakes an illness and manipulates his way out of it so he can see her. And then once again, we got where Priscilla really wants to have sex with him, but Elvis insists that they wait. Um, And they say goodbye. He goes back to the U S Priscilla stays in Germany and um, she's photographed with him at the airport. And then the press begins to investigate and they harass her at school and they're asking her questions. And then that scene of her doing a little press conference is intercut with Elvis giving an interview saying, Oh, Priscilla's just this girl that I was seeing, but she's not anything serious. Um, And so Priscilla is heartbroken. She misses Elvis. She's depressed. She's skipping school. She's not seeing her friends. She's lying to her parents. And at first Elvis doesn't call her reach out and everybody's like, he's done with you, get over it. But then in 1962, he gets back in touch and he asks her to come to LA to see him. And so she goes to, uh, from LA, she's supposed to stay there, but uh, Elvis is like, let's go to Vegas. So she writes a bunch of letters and instructs uh, El- Elvis's um, uh, one of the people who works for him to send them to uh, from LA to her parents. So they won't suspect. Um, and Elvis gives Priscilla this makeover with a giant beehive wig. Um, <laughs> and he gives her drugs um, like uppers at night, uh, uppers at night and downers during the day so that they can party all night. And then when she comes back home to Germany, she's got like ratty hair and smeared makeup and she looks insane and her parents freak. Um, But Priscilla just is on a mission to, to be with Elvis and she wins her mother over and then she's back at Graceland for Christmas. Um, Once again, like when Priscilla's there, Elvis is kind of ignoring her. And then he pushes her to take the sleeping pill. that's way too strong. And then she sleeps for two days. Um, And then after that, Elvis feels bad and he pays a lot of attention to her. So Priscilla 
is even after these, you know, sort of like red flag things, um, Priscilla is crazy in love and she is uh, horrible to her father and she bullies her parents into letting her move to Memphis to be with Elvis, um, to move to, uh, she's supposed to live with Elvis's father, but then Elvis is like, yeah, just come move in at Graceland. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, when she gets to, El uh, to Memphis, Elvis is off making movies and she is living in big empty Graceland and then there's this moment that reminded me of the Hitchcock film, Rebecca, where Priscilla sneaks into the attic and she tries on Elvis's mother's clothes because Elvis and his mother had this really close relationship and she had just died. And it's like, how do I fill the shoes um, of this woman in Elvis's life? So Elvis comes back and he acts kind of like... Uh, a jerk and he's telling Priscilla what to wear and what to do. I don't like this on you. You shouldn't wear this. You should wear this. Um, and he still doesn't want to have sex. This just keeps coming up. And so then they just are like taking sexy pictures of each other and, and, you know, um, but even though they're not having sex, Elvis is incredibly jealous of Priscilla and very controlling. She can't have friends at school. She can't bring anybody over. He's usually gone making movies. After she graduates from school, she gets a job modeling, but then Elvis makes her give it up. She's just supposed to kind of wait around for him to come back and not do anything, just kind of be in stasis until he arrives. Um, and then when she visits him in Hollywood, he wants her to go away because he's busy having an affair with Anne Margaret. Um, and then Priscilla doesn't want to leave and he threatens to send her back to Germany. And then he's throwing clothes around and screaming at her. And then when she starts to cry, he changes his mind and he lets her stay. And this is kind of how the story goes for a while. You know, like they get married, they buy a ranch, Priscilla gets pregnant and then while Priscilla's pregnant, Elvis decides that he wants a separation <laughs> while she's pregnant with his child. Um, Elvis has a big comeback. They move to Vegas. It, it's all of the Elvis story beats, but from Priscilla's perspective, it has this pattern where Elvis acts like um, a prick. He like shoots a TV or something like that. And he then, does that a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then he's sorry and he's sweet to Priscilla. And then it happens again. It's this like pattern of abuse kind of. And then finally Priscilla is in Vegas. The, um, oh, hold on, hold on a second. Uh, oh shit, my recording just stopped. Okay. okay. All right, yeah, we'll make this work. Okay, um, so uh, then, um, Here, hold on a second. Let me yeah, just. Yeah. Uh... I'll just brush my brush my hair. Wait, waiting for Elvis. Okay. Um. All right. So let me just take it from uh. From where it stopped. Okay. And uh, so then, in Vegas, uh, Elvis is getting way worse into drugs. Um, he's completely stopped having sex with Priscilla um, and is just sleeping with other women. And El then finally Priscilla has had enough and she takes Lisa Marie back to Graceland, her daughter. Um, and Priscilla starts to stand up to Elvis. And as he goes further into drugs, um, you know, Priscilla starts taking karate lessons and she has an affair with her karate instructor. Um, and she starts coming into her own and finding out who she is, you know, without Elvis. And meanwhile, Elvis, who was so in control before, has become this kind of zombie on pills. Um, but Priscilla still loves him and she keeps hoping that things will be the way that they were. And she goes to Elvis in Vegas and tries to reconcile with him and he rapes her 
um, because he knows that she's been having an affair and he's angry. And so uh, that, and that's the last straw. And then Priscilla tells him that she is going to leave him and she wants a divorce. And then years after their divorce, um, Elvis comes to see her and he is, you know, it's just, and he has, uh, you know, he's in his fat Elvis period. He's, you know, <laughs> using, he's, he's really ill um, from drugs and uh, he is trying to make a comeback by being in a star is born with uh barbara streisand but his manager doesn't want to let him do it and he asks priscilla to come back to him but priscilla he finally sees him clearly and she cares for elvis but she knows that it's impossible to live with him that he's a terrible husband um and then elvis cries in the limo on the way back home from seeing Priscilla. And then that dissolves into Priscilla in a limo going to Graceland because Elvis has died. And there's a montage of the photos of the real life Elvis and Priscilla set to his song, Always On My Mind. Um, and so, uh, Katie, why don't you tell me about watching this movie when it, first aired and how you experienced it then and what the attitude was sort of like towards Elvis in this movie. So I came into Elvis because I, my aunt BA, who was a huge, huge influence on my entire family. She was the glue that held the family together. She was a huge Elvis fan, huge. And she made, you know, she just, loved Elvis. And um, so that made, you know, she'd talk about him, she romanticized him, and she would have him on all the time. So um, I was kind of um, the secular Jesus story in a way. Like oh, yeah. I knew about his, you know, it, you know, he was born in a, sh a shotgun shack that his dad built in Mississippi, you know, like there was he had his own mythology. So um, and then my mom, she uh, owned a beauty shop and um, so many women that worked for her, especially one of my, she's not my aunt, but she was kind of like my aunt. It's, it's, a, it's yeah. a thing. Anyway, she loved Elvis and she was just, the only time she ever wasn't mean was when mm -hmm. she talked about Elvis. Cause otherwise she was like throwing things at me and whooping me. So like, she was pretty, <laughs> she was pretty mean, um, but she loved, she loved Elvis. And um, she talked about, oh, Priscilla and Elvis. Oh, he loved her. And I would hear about, you know, Elvis loved his mother. And he, and then I would hear from my mom, she would say, Elvis wanted Priscilla to be his mother. He tried to turn her into his mother. Mm. And um, I remember when it was coming out, it was a big deal. Like it was on, you know, the, on all the magazines uh, in the National Choir. Um, Cause this is, you know, this is when people were still like, uh, uh, I saw I spot that he faked his death. I spotted Elvis. You know, I mm -hmm. saw you know all those things. Um, so they yeah, were really only like ten years after he died, basically. Yeah, yeah. So there was still. I mean, I I for side note, side for this movie, I went to Graceland with my dad by accident one night, <laughs> and it happened to be the night <laughs> that it was the anniversary of Elvis's death, and it was twelve years after he died and the fans were out the streets were packed and i still have my candle that i held as we walked through graceland the night he died the anniversary oh, wow. it was it was pretty amazing i mean i was really amazing so um so elvis me when it came out i watched it and i just i felt like i felt so because i had seen other elvis movies and documentaries um my one of my my aunt Lori, she on my dad's side, she was she was a huge um, music fan in general. She loved um, all types of music. She was a radio DJ briefly and had posters all over her wall of like every musician like John Cougar Mellencamp, Bruce Springsteen, Elvis. And um, she 
I don't know how I got. Oh yeah, I don't. I don't know where I was going with that. Sorry, I started thinking about her bedroom. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, it's um, okay. Um, but but when the movie came out, oh you yeah, watched she, she, it and yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, sorry. <laughs> she would, she, anyway, she would show me like, this is Elvis and other biographies on Elvis. Anyway, so that they were always really boring. Like I was mm-hmm. not interested in like the Elvis, like I was like, oh, he did this. That's really cool. That's really cool. My dad would tell me when we were driving down to Memphis, like about Elvis and like how he did Sun records and uh, about all the blues musicians that he learned from and things like that. And, um, and then when I saw Elvis and me, I was like, this is how I relate to this story. Mm-hmm. And this is this speaks to me because I'm a young girl who super romanticizes, has parasocial relationships with <laughs> River Phoenix and like, you know, every single like actor that like Rob Lowe, like every single heartthrob from the 80s, I basically had a parasocial uh, relationship with. And so watching that, it, it, it spoke to that like one sided, like actual, you know, I think when I'm watch it now, like what if River Phoenix, you know, when I was 13, did that to me, I'd be, I would be Priscilla in a heartbeat. I would, yeah, yeah. whatever, be vegan, whatever. I mean, <laughs> sure, shave your head, whatever, be a Hare Krishna. Yeah. Like, um, and I, I remember just thinking, first of all, I thought the actress was gorgeous. So I was like, wow, mm-hmm. she's so pretty. And I, I it's still so ro- <laughs> I know it's weird, but it, it really is romantic in many ways, because as you know, when you're that young, you do think about being swept off your feet by someone bigger than you, someone larger mm-hmm. than life, you know, the, you know, tall, dark, handsome stranger in a way, and not in the way you think, you know, you're thinking more of like fairy tales and Snow White and things like that. But it's interesting to me because I do think in many ways, like the media groomed me, like the media that I watched in my relationship with how other women romanticized their relationship. Mm -hmm. They did like it was it was already set in stone for me to be romance, like romance, uh, romanticize the story. Because so many of the stories I heard romanticized it. And even when I watched it, everybody around me kind of echoed that except the scene where he did her hair like this Mm -hmm. i remember my mom saying when when he gave her the big bouffant he said oh my god this is when he turns her into his mother (laughs) and i remember that and it never left me i was like and then after that i always thought about that i always thought about how men try to turn you into their mother yeah and it never kind of left because even in elvis and me and and priscilla he after she gives birth he quits he doesn't want to have sex with her anymore yep yep because then she she becomes a mom and you can't you know yeah it's like he has these he has these very weird ideas about relationships that are like partially old-fashioned but i think partially also the the whole like um just being way 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 too close to your mother yeah (laughs) <laughs> his brother, you know, his twin died in, in in utero. His twin Jesse died before him, and then he was born twenty three minutes later. So that probably affected him, you know, and and affected the way that she treated him, and you know how possessive his mother was of him, yeah. and you know all yeah. So, um, um. So what was interesting to me when I watched it was I just want I wanted to be her and then when I went to Gros- Graceland with my dad the house was I mean the house was exactly what I saw in Elvis and me it was beautiful and I pictured her standing there by this white piano with her long long hair and waiting for him and just brushing her hair all day you know just brushing it and looking beautiful doing nothing which sounded great to me just looking beautiful and doing nothing sounded great and then we went downstairs and we saw all the TVs because they did shoot it at great. They they didn't shoot it at Graceland, but it was actually you said a soundstage, but it looked just like it. But but they did downstairs. the they did the exteriors, I think, at yeah. at Graceland. But then yeah. they did the interiors on a soundstage. There, the when you go in the basement, uh, there's the carpeted carpeted basement with all the TVs. He would shoot out, and the guy told us that they always had to replace TVs because he would shoot at them. He would shoot his gun regularly. And I thought that was funny. 
that stuck with me. I liked that. I was like, yeah. I don't know what was eight. I was like eight. I was like, yeah, that's mm. cool. Um, but I just, I, it, it just kind of sealed the deal for me. And um, I would say that movie did groom me um, in many ways, like the mythology that I was raised with kind of set me up to be in imbalanced romantic relationships where I was, you know, because that was one of the more um, realistic movies I saw. Like, um, it, you know, it wasn't 16 Candles and it wasn't Breakfast Club. It, it was Elvis and, you know, Elvis and me. It's like, this is a real thing that happened and this could happen. Like, it could happen. This fantasy, this fantasy could happen. And um, mm -hmm. even, the, even the stuff at the end didn't really bother me at the time because she looked so good yeah it, this is this is interesting to me uh that i would you know looking on letterbox or imdb there are people who have gone to watch the movie now sort of in preparation for priscilla and they have one take on the movie and then there's the people who saw it in the 80s and overwhelmingly they're like it's so romantic this is such a romantic movie and I was a little gagged at that because I felt like this movie really showed Elvis in a bad light. Like, you know, it really made him look like an asshole and <laughs> really made him look abusive where I was like, wow, I can't believe they're going this hard on Elvis. Yeah. Um, like that they did that. that that they would be allowed to um so the f and my experience of watching the movie was um you know i watching the part one i kept kind of stopping it and going off and doing something else because i was like this isn't good this is not oh there's so many like this is not gonna end well priscilla don't open that door don't open that door girl <laughs> Like, <laughs> listen to your stepfather. Um, I, I was nervous because I was like, ooh. Um, and, and you know, then it, it didn't. It didn't turn out that well. And there was never really, like, um, a moment of completely unspoiled, like, happiness where everything is great and nothing bad happens because every time that you feel like something like that is going to happen uh like you know there she comes to visit him and then they go to vegas then he always does something like he gives yeah. her a pill or something happens to sort of like cast a shadow over like how everything is beautiful and amazing and romantic um so it I guess it just has to do with uh and and I felt like the like the director was being very intentional too with how he was presenting this, you know, like uh especially that moment when Priscilla was doing the press conference um in Germany after Elvis had left and then yeah. he was giving an interview saying, "Oh, she was just some girl. She wasn't that important." Um, then I was like, oh, okay, yes, this director is very intentionally <laughs> making, uh, being like Elvis is a jerk. Um, and, and so, uh, but, but as you say, you know, I'm, I'm not like, Katie, what's wrong with you? Because, you know, it really, so many people in those reviews who, saw it the first time were like such an amazing love story and blah 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 Elvis you know it really seemed to be how people experienced this at the time some people super Elvis fans were like she's just dissing him for publicity you know she's she's bitter um but uh but a lot of people experienced it um very romantically how did you experience it this time around watching it now well it was hard um because i was watching it between two 
sides. I was watching yeah. myself watch it, and I was watching <laughs> it as the woman I am now. Yeah. Um, the woman in me, to quote Brittany, you know. <laughs> um, it's almost as if the Priscilla at the end of the movie I'm the Priscilla at the end of the movie where she's in the, you know, in the limo <laughs> going to Graceland to do the funeral where she's reflecting on this relationship. And, you know, I'm almost looking at the movie through a grown woman's eyes and thinking, wow, no, no, I cannot believe I romanticized this. And I, I, I and it wasn't clear to me when I was younger. It wasn't clear. It, what, it was like to me, even the scene where he was like, oh, just some girl. I was like, oh, to have him talk about you at all. <laughs> like, yeah, you have him acknowledge you, you know, wow, you're just so lucky. And to be clear, like I was raised in that culture of like, you know, you have to, you're, you know, it, it, it's very confusing to me because like that was one of the reasons I didn't wear makeup and I didn't dress up was because it was always like I heard from a couple of my aunts that, you know, you have to, you know, dress up, you have to attract him. He likes you. You want to get this like football, you know, football player type. And, you know, that made me the opposite, even though I romanticized something like Priscilla and Elvis, I was just hoping he would see me because i'm thinking he he just you know it's mystical when you're younger you're thinking wow he really likes her for her and then when you grow up and you're like you're thinking about the time you hit puberty and you're thinking about the older men that hit on you mm -hmm. the, the teachers that wanted to give you a ride home and um all those things that all the horrible relationships you you're in with men your own age that try to just tell you how to dress and tell you those things watching it was a lot harder. Mm -hmm. And I almost was thinking, how did they get away with making this an 88? Right. Um, especially the rape scene. I was mm. like, um, I can't believe I watched this when I was eight and I didn't get it. Like, I just thought it was like, like the scene in Gone with the Wind where, you know, Rhett takes sweeps you know takes scarlet up the stairs yeah you know, yeah you know what it's like i'm gonna give it to you you know because i'm saying it's you you're groomed to think this is romantic you're groomed to think you know take being taken by your will is you see it in movies yeah. you see it in older movies yeah and I, and, and, and I don't think you know and i don't think that it was the director's intention to make that scene romantic like looking no. at it it's not shot or presented in a way that's romantic but just with the the tenor of the culture at the time um people saw it in a people it took the 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 tone of the movie in a different way than maybe it was even intended <laughs> Yeah. And also you have to, you know, in 88, the internet didn't exist. So these conversations, I mean, would be halved by probably, you know, the Elvis fans would, would not, I doubt they would see this and see harm. They would see mm -hmm. it and be like, wow, you know, still, even with that scene, they would, they would have some cognitive dissonance against it. Yeah. Whereas I think the small group of women who didn't have an, uh, a thing for Elvis would watch it and talk, talk amongst themselves in groups quietly. And they didn't have the internet to, to, to be a platform for them. Yeah. And that is, that is one of the effects of that is the, the kind of overtone of the media, the kind of culture sets, sets how it's perceived. The viewership sets how it's perceived, you know, it had yeah. all these viewers and it was all over the, and it was considered a successful, uh, movie, TV movie. Yeah. So that, that is how it's perceived. And there wasn't any backlash. It, it, there was not backlash. It was still talked about like the next day, like, Oh gosh, you know, when she's in the limo and you know, she's, Oh, like, I mean, it was still, it was still, I mean, I, I had women crying watching that, you know, and, mm -hmm. and talking about it. So in, in the eighties, um, but watching it now, I see this, this kind of, th I see my old patterns of thinking and how that mm -hmm. groomed me in many ways to romanticize women being in passive, um, passive positions 
and the myth of the like the pretty girl the myth of the chosen girl you know the girl with the yeah. most cake and mm -hmm. you know and i think it was really good i'll say this about courtney love i think one of the things i loved about courtney love was she, in many ways she she was the priscilla to kurt in a different way but she was active it wasn't it was like they were the king and queen of like you know grunge music in in this way and it was like she had her little crown and she was like this dysfunctional uh nancy spunion character that i was like she, you know she she's taking that role back and showing how you know uh one day you will ache uh like i ache you know and um you know all those things about loving someone who kind of belongs to the public and things like that. And just, I, I loved how messy she was. And it, to me, to me, I saw that character of Priscilla in that if, if that character was allowed to be messy and to express herself, that's what she would sound like in many ways, yeah. in my opinion. I don't know yeah, if that's true. I, I don't know if I, other people feel that way. But. Well, I, I think that, you know, I mean, Courtney was somebody who, um, you know, I think, Kurt was attracted to her for her personality and for her talent and, you know, th those things. Um, and he liked her activeness. Um, yeah. Whereas it was clear to me in both versions of this film, um, because this is, this is one thing that I want to sort of make clear is that, you know, I haven't read the book, so I can't say, this is what Elvis did, but I can I can say, and and even with the book, that is through Priscilla's perspective and also Priscilla's memories as a teenage girl, and you know you can't say this is the absolute truth, um, but uh, in the TV movie version and in Sofia Coppola's version, um, there keeps being this. Uh, people keep saying, well, why is he choosing you? He could have any woman that he wants. Why is he choosing you? And there's, um, it's not so much of, uh, you know, he chose you out of all the women in the world, but like, what? what? Why? <laughs> and there seems to be the way that it's presented in both films. It feels like he, you know, is sending sending a friend of his out to like find pretty young girls and bring them back and and it's not so much to have sex with them but um i guess he he was looking for somebody that he could uh shape and mold into what he wanted rather than you know an ann margaret who, you know, at one point he's like, "Oh, you know, she's like all those starlets. She just wants a career." you know yeah and yeah and so he wanted somebody that he could mold into his own ideal image of a wife and a girlfriend and a, a woman um and so uh and and the the thing though is in elvis and me um that particular version of Priscilla in the TV movie, she is is quite active, especially as um, a young teenager in yes. in the part one. Um, she is very uh, she's like love crazy in this really intense way that that feels real. It feels like how teenage girls get about <gasps> you know about and and. It's this so is how, true. And this is how teenage girls get about like, um, you know, Harry Styles or something like that. Or I don't know, even know who they're going crazy about right now. But like, you know, <laughs> how they get about just a pop star that they love. So, you know, if they're actually, it, you know, dating that person, oh you God. know, this absolute teenage girl's dream come true. Um she is fucking bananas in love with him and will do anything and says horrible things to her parents and lies and, and cheats and does everything to, to get that thing. Um, and, I did that. and that feels, that feels very, you know, just from my own experience, <laughs> seeing teenage girls when they first, fall in love it is this like huge all-consuming thing 
Um, so it was interesting for me to see a portrayal of that that was not, um, it didn't necessarily, it didn't show it in a flattering light, but also it wasn't making fun of her for it. Um, it was taking it seriously, um, but it was also showing that she was like, you you could, the, the movie wasn't hiding that Priscilla was, um, was fighting so hard, but she was not working in her own best interest. <laughs> I mean, I, I did the same thing. So, mm -hmm. um, my, and it, it's, it's embarrassing. And I, <laughs> that, it, and it was traumatic. The things I went through and did and humiliated myself crying in front of people. And now I look back and I'm like, oh my God, him, like, <laughs> you know, and that's the thing. At, at least she got, <laughs> at least she had Elvis and he bought her nice dresses. Like sometimes yeah you know you you're just so you're so you're so full of um hormones and this like you have this like need to latch onto something that that takes over you it's just overpowering it it, it it's like a switch that turns on all of a sudden and you're just like where can i put this energy i have all this energy i, I need to put it on something i need to put it to something and it if you're lucky, you know, you get a pop star or you get an actor. And if you're, you know, that way you don't have to like waste your time on the local townies, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, and it was very accurate and it does a lot of damage. I've seen what teenage girls in love do to each other and do to their families. Like when I was growing up, a lot of the girls I knew they would, they dropped out of high school, they got pregnant, they, they dated guys that were like 10 years older than them that were drug dealers, you know, that were bad boys or whatever. I went to Catholic school. So I yeah. hope this is people understand like, <laughs> like yeah, Catholic yeah. school girls always date guys like this. Well, some of them <laughs> do, but they, I mean, just the screaming, I could hear people, girls I grew up with screaming down the street, you know, running away. Like their parents would come over. Have you seen so-and-so? And I'm like, no. And they're like, she's with him again i mean like it it, it, <laughs> oh, it, it, it it's real it was yeah. real the damage that my boyfriends incur uh, it, uh, occurred on me and like my naive family was like what is going on and i'm like i'm crazy i just want to be i'm twice i just want i don't want anything like i didn't want to do anything i just wanted him mm -hmm. and then once i got him i was like i don't know what i'm bored you know. Yeah, I don't know what to do. It, I don't know it, what to do. Dog, the dog that caught the car. Exactly. Um, <laughs> and you're like, oh, that's what this is? I thought this was a spaceship. I, it's a car. <laughs> okay, bye. Like, yeah, so I, I, but like I said, it's it's overwhelming energy that needs to be put somewhere. And all I was, and I was watching her and I was just thinking like, when I was younger, I thought it was really romantic. I was like, oh, you know, a teenager in love and, uh, you know, I, I, I saw it differently. And then when I was older, I was like, and I was covering my face in many ways. Cause I was like thinking this is how it can be for a lot mm -hmm. of Rome. Like I am a romantic person. I romanticize things I you know, and, um, when you have those seeds planted in you, you want to plant, you want them to go somewhere. So all I can imagine is she actually got her crush. I can't even imagine. I, I couldn't go to school after that. You kidding me? No. Yeah, 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 no. It, and it was very much that. I And I I liked that um, the uh, uh, Susan Walters, the actress who played Priscilla, um, that she really did go there. And um, she her, her Priscilla had some real fire to her, which you could see her having to to push down you know as she was uh and so seeing all of that fire in her in the beginning it sort of made sense when she finally sort of came into her own at the end you were like yes because she always had this in her um but it it was one thing that it was interesting she looked a lot like priscilla um, but she, 
really didn't look 14 in the scenes where she was playing 14. She looked like she was in her 20s. She and Elvis where, you know, they say, wow, you're only 14. Um, <laughs> but they looked sort of evenly matched. And and it was around the same time when, you know, on TV, um, teenagers were, you know, like late 80s, early 90s. You know, you had like, you know, 21 Jump Street or Beverly Hills 90210 or things like that, where you have teenagers being played by 20-somethings. Yeah. Um, and so there's this whole idea of like, oh, this is a teenager, but it 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 didn't really hit you the 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 age difference didn't hit you nearly as hard in this as it did in Sofia Coppola's movie, which is funny because they also had a 25 year old actress playing her in that. Oh wow. But but yeah, I know. I was like, wow, she's 25. Um, the uh, the actress who plays her in, um, let me see, what what's her uh, her name? I think um, she won back Best is, Actress uh, at Cannes too. Yeah, Kaylee Spaney. Um, she won uh, she won the Volpe Cup at the Venice Film Festival for Best Performance. Um, and yeah, she was. I don't know when they shot it. Maybe she was 24, but. Um, in that, she looks so young. She looks very she looked young. Really young. Um, she looks really young. She looks really young. But then also, Jacob Elordi is so freakishly tall um, yes. that it just really visualizes. I, I thought that that was... Uh, I, I, I appreciated that they, even though like Elvis wasn't that tall, um, <laughs> that, that they found a way to visualize that power difference um, because it hits differently when you can really see it that clearly and you're like oh this really is a, a child um, instead of you know like oh this is just a you know a, a, a 25 year old woman with pigtails um, <laughs> um, but I I did really like uh, Susan Walter's performance I thought she had a really really strong performance and um she wasn't, she didn't really go on to, to, I mean, I, I noticed that she had sort of smaller parts in some movies that I recognized. Um, I think she was mostly TV. Um, but I think this was a, this is a good feather in her cap for her career. Yeah. Um, now then there was a uh, Dale Midkiff. Um, He's in Pet Cemetery. Yeah, yeah. And I'd, I'd seen him in some things. He played Elvis. Um, now, the way that I, I thought th there were certain things. Now, he um, he doesn't. Uh, um, he doesn't look like Elvis, like in the face um, and in the styling it doesn't, it doesn't quite come off. I thought like visually he, um, he looked a little bit more like, a, you know, like, like, like a Fabian or one of those guys who, who came after Elvis. Um, and the, the voice isn't always right on, but he does have this sort of like, um, this sort of like sullen, slightly dangerous kind of thing that Elvis had and this like kind of lazy Southern way of speaking and laid back. Um, and he, he's got, he's got that, um, that quality of Elvis that could be um, charming or it could seem dangerous and that that and then they really kind of work that for Elvis being, you know, scary at certain points, be, you know, making the switch from like sexy to scary. Um, and so even though it's not it's not a perfect Elvis performance, it's not um, Austin Butler, um, you know, in Baz Luhrmann, who did, you know, probably like maybe the best Elvis that I've seen. But um it it definitely does capture like uh, these certain uh, 
Elvis qualities that um, that were so important to his appeal, I guess. Yes. I mean, this was probably besides the actor from Hairspray, uh, John Waters' original Hairspray, who looked like yeah. Elvis. Oh, he yeah, played he did. Elvis. <laughs> Yeah, he did. And he I remember watching Hairspray. I was like, oh, my God, he should play Elvis. And he did. He played Elvis in a in a TV movie as well. But he played him too sweet. Mm, Whereas yeah. this, I believed he had that like, you know, leader of the pack. You know, mm -hmm. he had that. My folks he, were always putting, him, putting down. him. Yeah, he had yeah. that danger and he had that like. He 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 has that quality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's why they they cast him. They were like, oh, okay, he's got that thing where it's like oh, he, this could be, you know, he kind of looks and he, like it could be dreamy or it could be scary. Um, well, he another one of his performances that I really like was in a TV movie with Shannon Doherty. Oh yeah, Mark, yeah. It, he and he he was great in it. He plays another kind of like Southern bad boy. He plays a Margaret Mitchell's husband who she based the character of Rhett on. Oh. In, in the TV movie, his name is Red. Mm. And um, it's a really good performance. One of Shannon Doherty's best, actually. I really love that TV movie. Oh. It's up. Uh, yeah. I recommend it's, a, it's I think it's the light, the story of Margaret Mitchell. Yeah. It's okay. TV movie. Um. And, you know, as we've been saying in this, uh, in this movie, excuse me, you know, uh, every, it, 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 this has a, Elvis and me has uh, a, oh, let's see, let me get my, um, but, yeah, you're fine. Yeah. Elvis and me um, definitely does not show Elvis in a flattering light. It shows him as somebody who is kind of predatory, kind of, uh, um, and it literally where sometimes he kind of seems like a big cat, you know, that's like, like stalking a little bit. There's like something dangerous, you know, that's what I mean by, and, and then there's also, you know, he can be abusive, but he can be charming. Um, but uh, it's it's so interesting that um, we do not, you know, we don't see the colonel once in any of yeah. this. And, uh, and he was such a major figure in Baz's film, in Baz Luhrmann's film. Uh, and I think in some way, when I was watching this, I was thinking, oh, part of, you know, in in Baz Luhrmann's film, it's all about how um, the colonel was controlling Elvis and Elvis couldn't stand up to him and tell him no, even though when he did stand up to him, something good ha would happen. Um, he ultimately couldn't say no. And that got him locked in at Vegas and led to his downfall. Um, yeah. And it's this sort of tragedy. Um, but at the same time that that was happening, it was like Elvis needed to have power over somebody. And so he was doing the same thing to Priscilla that the Colonel was doing to him. Yeah. Um, you know, I love that <laughs> point you made. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's, uh, it's like, he's got to feel like he's in control of something because he's not in, he's clearly not in control of his own life or career. Um, and it, but this, this version really showed him um, as, uh, as an asshole and also kind of emotionally immature. Like that makes me think of that thing of, um, you know, people don't grow emotionally past the age where they first become famous yeah. So Elvis is kind of always 18, like hanging out with his buddies that are really on, you know, that he really pays to be his buddies. And they're all like goofing around or playing football or doing whatever. But he's he always kind of comes off a little teenagery. Very true. Very true. Are you talking about Priscilla? Um, well, he, he he comes off, I think, in Priscilla 
um, the Jacob Elordi's performance leans even more into that. That's where, what I was saying. Yeah. Yeah. Where that version uh, of Elvis feels like um, he's just this big kid who never grew up. And the yeah. moments when he is an asshole and he is abusive, it feels more like a little kid having a tantrum. Yes. Uh, like in in Priscilla, uh, there's a scene where they're kind of flirting in the bedroom and they start having a little pillow fight. And then Priscilla is like winning the pillow fight. And then he gets mad and hits her. Yeah. And, and, and it's literally, and she's like, you can't lose it anything, can you? Um, and it, it feels literally like a little boy being like, well, then I don't want to play with you anymore. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And she was his little, and, and Priscilla, the movie versus Elvis and me, and Priscilla, it was very clear, like, this is his little doll. Mm -hmm. And he's dressing her up, especially because she looked a lot younger and she was more passive in this movie. Um, the, the actress playing Priscilla was a lot more passive. The, the, the way it was directed, she, she felt like she was kind of like, um, going along with certain things um not as pers like the priscilla in elvis and me who was like f fighting and crying and we felt sh this action yeah um, yeah it and, really and came I off that he was dressing her and telling her you know they show that scene where he humiliates her in front of people about the print they show him doing that to her in private but in elvis and me he looks even meaner because he humiliates her and says why are you wearing prints it doesn't look good on you when she said she you know she had to go to bed mm -hmm. um and she storms he off and one of elvis's like entourage ladies says i've been helping her pay that off on layaway you know why do you have to be so mean to her um, yeah, yeah. He's doing it in front of other people. I think um, so. Yeah, to just to we can you know go go into Priscilla and and that what you know the whole different vibe of that. I think um, it you know it's the same story. It's a lot of the same beats and scenes, but the take on the characters is very different. And I think yeah, the take on Priscilla. Um, like you said, she is much more passive and it really feels big time. Like, you know, why does he choose her? It's, uh, it's so clear that, uh, that he's choosing her in order to make her his doll. Um, because she's just sort of a regular girl, um, who happens to be very pretty. Um, and Elvis keeps saying, oh, well, she's really mature for her age. And then you're looking at them and you're like, no, she's not. No. Um, and uh, it's uh, then Elvis, and you would, you would think, and I went into the movie thinking, okay, if they gave it to Elvis in Elvis and me, if they made him look like an asshole in that, they're going to make him look like a monster in this because this is, you know, modern and culture is so different and everything, but it really kind of showed Elvis as uh, this um, big kid uh, who, like you said, has this little doll. There's a great scene where uh, I, I, he buys her a dog and it's a dog in, in she goes out and he's in this teeny, teeny little fenced in area that's only like a few feet around. And you're like, oh, that's Priscilla, a little poodle running around in a very tiny little fenced in area. Um, yes. And they, they, th that's the thing about um, Priscilla is that it's an intensely visual film. It's super visual in to the point where the, the dialogue doesn't feel very important. I can't really remember much of the dialogue. Um, it's the way that things look. It's the height difference. It's the costumes and the set and the costume design is is fantastic as I it would expect to, to be with a Sofia Coppola movie. Um, and they have these like fake 
magazine covers and album covers with Jacob Elordi's face that are really good. Um, And, uh, and like, and the hair and the set design, all of it are really good. Um, And also I have to say like the, the, the scene where he's like wants her to get guns and then they show like the guns matching the outfits and all of the guns with their different, (laughs) with their different color coordinated, uh, (laughs) Outfits with their different color coordinated guns. Yes. Um, that was that was great. Um and and they nailed the the wedding look, which you noted in Elvis and Me was uh they they gave her bangs. Bangs. Which is like, why uh, Priscilla never had bangs. She never had bangs. <laughs> um not even on Dynasty. Yeah. I guess she was on Dynasty. Um but then at the same time, uh, it, it feels um, because it was so visual and because they made Priscilla more of a passive character, the movie felt more muted. And yeah. when we got to the end, they softened the rape scene where he didn't actually rape her. He like kind of grabbed at her and then she went away. And because the the stakes were lower and it just felt, you, you saw her making progress towards um, becoming more independent, but the payoff just didn't feel the same. It didn't feel as, as big of a payoff as it did in, in Elvis and Me. And so, it just didn't resonate in the same way. the The movie felt more like um, like a riff on what it feels like to be wandering around in a beautiful mansion, completely alone and very lonely. Yeah. Um, Marie Antoinette. Yeah, and that's and that's the thing is um, I, I was I was thinking about how with these Elvis movies. Um, it, it because he's such an icon um people the, the people who have made movies about him tend to project themselves or find the parts of the stories the story that they resonate with and so you know Baz Luhrmann he's such a showman and he like, likes things to be so operatic and he resonated the most with the colonel who was the showman you know, yeah. and that was the part of the story that he focused on. And Sofia Coppola, her movies are always about these women in gilded cages who are um, very privileged, but very lonely and kind of uh, have this this isolating privilege that's oppressive. Um, yeah. And and that was the part of the story that that resonated with her. And so it. It doesn't, you know, I, I was like, okay, neither of these, neither of these are really Elvis or really Priscilla. It's almost like these directors kind of making movies about themselves through the lens of, of these other people, you know, or at least about their, the, the parts that resonate with them, you know, but, yeah. uh, but it's not, um, it, 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 they, it felt, it felt very personal in in that way um whereas like she was doing her very specific take on this material in a way that resonated with her well let's let's get to the the issue there which is yeah she is on one hand but the other she was locked in yes lisa Lisa marie was constantly threatening her and sending her emails and Mm -hmm. you know she was working with legacy material and the you know the the Elvis enterprise is a, is a billion dollar business. Now, uh, I can see, I can't, you know, making a movie is incredibly stressful, even if it's your own material. Yes. I can't imagine making this film and having to constantly tiptoe around somebody telling you what and what you can't do or fear of litigation. Yes. You and know. and and Priscilla was in very much involved in this, and so I imagine that she also had a good deal of say in what 
was and was not going to be in the movie. And yeah. there was that article, I think, in Variety that was saying that, um, you know, 10 pages were cut from the script, which is a lot, um, which, you know, they also lost some funding. They lost $2 like $2 million dollars. in funding. And so they had to cut down the shooting schedule. Um, but it's, they had only yeah. six weeks to shoot this. And I'll say this. Another thing is when they made Elvis and me, the time had only, you know, there were still uh, many items and things like that, locations to get that were mid-century. A lot yeah. of the big, you know, demolition projects of the 90s where everything became big, you know, Mick, you know, everything was Mega Mansion, big, big stores, everything got really extreme in the 90s. So, and you know, we want new stuff. We want big mansions. We want new stuff. The mid-century stuff that uh, locations, cars, and things that existed, clothing that existed m was more available. And so therefore things, when it's more available, it's, it's less expensive. It's cheaper to get and easier to get. Um, so now she's, you know, recreating those looks and things. They cost more money to create because they're so different. Yeah, the cars and everything. I think most of their budget went into the production design, and I bet even then they were on, you know, a shoestring budget. So it's it's fascinating to me how even filmmaking has changed. You you know how probably I don't know how much it costs to make Elvis and Me because TV movies are hard to get the budget for. Yeah, but they probably shot that on film. Yeah, which is expensive, but. I think everything a lot back then, you didn't have so many middlemen as you do now. You didn't have such high everyone, you know, wanting a cut of this. It was probably cheaper to make for a lot of factors back then. Whereas now everything, it's like everything has got an inflated amount. So, and then put, you put that on, you know, least you put that on the budget constraints and the scarcity issue and then you also have Lisa Marie. And then, you know, she didn't shoot the exteriors at Graceland, which is interesting to me because Elvis and me did. Elvis yeah. and me in 1988 shot at Graceland. They shot the exteriors there. And the only reason I think that was able to happen was because I do think Priscilla was involved in that because Priscilla was the, um, she was the, Ex she was executor the, of the ex executor estate. of Graceland yeah. until 1993 when Lisa Marie turned 25. Yes. So Lisa Marie wasn't letting them shoot the exteriors of Graceland. So yeah, that's, yeah, it's it's very fascinating. And another, um, well, and I I would say also, you know, just how with how movies are made now, that um, there's not so many like mid budget movies. If this was the early 2000s, I guarantee you that Sofia Coppola would have gotten a much bigger budget for this movie, and it yeah. would have been like you know a real Oscar movie but now it was like you know maybe 15 20 million something like that which isn't you know million. nothing it was 10, it was 10. It was 10. Oh, yeah it was 10 10 uh, million dollars yeah that's Minus which two. that's that's low that is low. low and so you can and it looked incredible for that but you could see that you know it was um you know, there weren't a lot of big crowds when they were shooting crowds. It was sort of cheated in a way to kind of make it look like there were more people than hey, there Hey, let's really not were. give away the secrets now. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, but I think another way that all of this plays in in an interesting way is um, about the permissions and stuff is the music of these two films. Yes. Neither of them were able to use the recordings of Elvis, but they dealt with that in different ways. Um, now... In Elvis and Me, they had, which I think this was so smart, they had a really, really good Elvis impersonator named Ronnie McDowell um, sing the songs. And they sort of recorded new versions. And sometimes you could hear it in the arrangements. You were like, this sounds a little cheap compared to the original. But he really did sound like Elvis and that allowed them the freedom to have like Elvis playing the piano and singing and, and singing within scenes because they could dub it in with this. Uh, and, and that gave them the opportunity to use lots and lots of Elvis songs and show Elvis performing and all of that stuff um, in a way that didn't feel like uh, somebody was just uh, lip syncing along to the, 
original recordings. Um, But Priscilla couldn't get the rights to the Elvis music. Um, So she went, Sophia Coppola went in that kind of Marie Antoinette direction where um, she was pulling music from all over the place. There was Brenda Lee in there, but then there was also more modern music, you know, music from, uh, you know, from today or from the nineties and, uh, and, you know, pulling that from all over the place um, really uh, made you, it, it, it kept it from being too stuck in the past and being about a, you know, a story about, how, about the the 1950s and 60s and you know it made you think like oh yeah you know there are um it it made it feel contemporary in a way and the whole idea of uh, a woman uh being trapped in a, a relationship with uh, a a huge difference in power um that's there's there's nothing old about that that still happens now so uh one thing i have to say about mm -hmm. whoever the music supervisor she brought in was amazing they did an excellent Mm -hmm. job and i will point out when um brenda lee that song sweet nothings when when they meet in priscilla when priscilla meets elvis and and sophia coppola's movie that is the song playing sweet nothings and i saw brenda lee in concert like four years, five years ago. Hell and yeah. she said when she was talking about, she goes, I used to sing this. She goes, when I met Elvis, he came up to me and he said, me and Priscilla used to listen to this, uh, your song, uh, Sweet Nothings when we were, you know, necking in Germany and stuff like that. And I thought that was so cute because she, you know, she lit up when she told the story and then she sang the song Sweet Nothings. And that was a song that, they played i thought and then what i really loved is the ending they they had dolly parton's i will always love you play as um as priscilla left which i loved because we all know the story that elvis was supposed to record i will always love you but the colonel the day they were going to record did did a fast one on dolly and was like oh yeah by the way you have to sign your publishing rights away to elvis if you Mm -hmm. wanted to record this song and she said no and then, you know, we all know what happened with Whitney Houston's recording it and making it even bigger hit. Um, so I thought that was just really clever tying in all these different Elvis mythologies and histories and things together um, in different timelines. I, I liked that a lot. Yeah. 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 I know I did. I did, too. I thought that I mean, I. I, I was I was really impressed with the the look of the movie, with the music, with the performances, um, all of those things. Um, but uh, and and I think that it got it it definitely nailed those things. Uh, you know the 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 look and the wigs and all of that stuff more so than than Elvis and me did. Um, but then uh, Elvis and me was more kind of uh passionate and it went darker and and deeper and it's so sophia it's not your fault we're not blaming you yeah. it's not that you were trying to softball there were you know circumstances beyond your control but ultimately i think elvis and me went much darker than uh than priscilla did and so even though you know, I don't think that Elvis and me is a perfect movie. You know, there's, I don't, I don't really like how, you know, like when they're trying to show how time passes, they keep having these um, little. Uh, news clip. Yeah. Yeah. They have these, these uh, news clips, these sequences of real life footage. And it's like, here's some hippies. Here's Vietnam. You know, it's the I late don't know. 60s. I kind of like that i I, now listen i I do i i liked it i liked it when it showed the real um elvis and uh and priscilla because you could really see just like the 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 way that they looked together was amazing the iconography of it and they really did at least in the footage that they showed i was like oh they really 
do seem very into each other and they just look so incredible together. Um, but uh, I, 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 I preferred them in Priscilla just kind of showing time passing with clothes and styling and stuff like that without being so much like, you know, um, it's the 1950s. Here's a waitress with a malted milkshake, you know, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, but I, 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 it was cool to see that footage though. Um, but uh, I, I think that, uh, yeah, yeah. Priscilla, maybe um, they both, they both bring different things to the story. Um, and so um it's hard for me to say that one of them was a clear winner for me out of, you know, oh, well, this one is the one that you should see um, because each one has something that the other one doesn't have, uh, which is a little bit of a cop out, but because um, that's what I said about Blonde too. But um, well, what what was your take on the two? You know, with, uh, you, you, you prefer Elvis and me, I think. I do. I love Elvis yeah. and me. I do. I just, I, I love it. I love the ending. I love, I love how it shows um, that at the end, you know, in the beginning, he's such a powerful figure when she meets him. And then at the end, she's the one who's matured and she's the, not the one in control, but she's the one who has grown up and she's matured and she's independent. And now he's kind of this comes to her the way she came to him in a way yeah you know, instead of her being at his door he comes to her door and he's he's the helpless one he's the one who's like well are you gonna you know they switch positions and i really need i liked that a lot and i i really like um because i do think you know i i do think the problem with presentism in our day and age that just is very militant and wants to cancel people and wants to get rid of everybody is it has a amnesia to it it has um it's blind rage it's mob mentality where it's not really seen like you know she really did have a deep relationship with him whether you guys like it or not because it's not like r kelly who literally like i said come to my high school and just get pick up girls and toss them away no like he she Vern had her be you know the heir to graceland when he passed on and she she's the reason why graceland exists like she went and she got a ceo to take over and make it a museum so that his legacy could endure she kept that going as we as we we've discussed with many celebrities and and actors like river phoenix we wish that his legacy endured and people talked about him without having to mention oh you mean joaquin the actor's brother yeah you know, with she she carried on that yeah so, and, and i i I mm -hmm. think Elvis and me shows more complicated story. Yeah. Than, than I Priscilla. Agree. Cause Priscilla shows a very, to me, a very passive, almost like he filled her up. Like she mm -hmm. didn't have anything going for her and, and, and she filled him, you know, like it felt very influencer like, like almost like I see a lot of young girls go to LA and they have an older guy groom them. And then they're like, now I'm a Pilates instructor. <laughs> and it, it felt more like that than actually the the kind of relationship that Priscilla and Elvis had, um, which was a lot more collaborative, especially if you watch her Vogue um, look book where she talks about designing clothes and designing his clothes and designing his logos and them having this kind of symbiotic collaborative relationship that they didn't really show in Priscilla or in Elvis and me actually. Yeah, that, that's that, true. That is relying on true stories and just anecdotal things on the side, you know? Um, yeah. And that, that's something that I, that, that struck me because watching the, the, the little bit of footage of the real Priscilla and Elvis, I was they had a lot of sexual chemistry together and a lot of just, I was like, wow, these people just seem very into each other, at least in what they're showing. And so, and I don't think that either of the movies really showed that. I think that this is like every, every human relationship is complicated and yeah. I don't think, and this one especially, and I don't think that you can, uh, confidently say oh well elvis was just an abuser and that's all that this was or 
Elvis really loved her. And that's all that this was. I think that it was very complex. And, and also you can't, you know, say that it was a clear narrative where like, oh, Priscilla, you know, was, was held down, but then she came into her own and blossomed and flowered because, you know, not very long after he died, she went off and joined Scientology. And then she had, you know, new people to control her life and tell her what to do. So it's like, um, it's, uh, um, you, you can't, you can't, um, and any time that you take a story from real life and you turn it into a movie and you put it into the confines of a narrative, then you always have to, kind of, uh, you know, hammer out the complexities and turn it into this one thing. Um, and I don't think that either of these movies um, really capture that, um, you know, like you said, her, maybe how active and collaborative their relationship could be while also being abusive. Yeah, I mean, because you those things are so subtle and you really only see them up close. Yeah. You know, I mean, they're not they don't transfer to the screen. Well, the things that transfer to the screen well are operatic visual things. Yeah, not not it's people. If you try to tell a, like those are called mood pieces or where it's when you show subtlety, a lot of people don't understand. So I yeah. think Sofia Coppola, uh, you know, tried to do that. Yeah, uh, it, it she she had a lot of constraints. Yeah, yeah, she did. Um, but but I think that she was I it it felt um, it definitely felt like a like an honest depiction of, um, you know, the, the the life of a of a trophy wife, you know, kind of <laughs> and and how limiting that can be. Hey, don't knock my gig. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Polly speaking... Shore, where you at? Are you trophy wife. <laughs> Um, speaking of big dramatic moments that um, yeah. uh, translate well to the screen, I thought it might be a good time for our Mary Catherine Gallagher monologue. Yes. Uh, um, can I be Elvis? <laughs> you always have me be the woman <laughs> and be the, no, be the the big part. No, it's I a don't collaborative. It. Listen, it's our collaborative relationship. Yeah, no, it's true. It's true. Um, okay. All right. I will, even though you are visually Priscilla at the moment. I will be Priscilla. She's um, taking over. Yes. Uh, Presentism. So, uh, <laughs> um, so this is our Mary so, Catherine Gallagher monologue, which is named after the SNL character, um, superstar, who was always doing uh, monologues from TV movies um, to express her emotions. And so... With each TV movie, we find one monologue that feels like something that Mary Catherine Gallagher would have busted out in an SNL sketch. And this one, it's from the near the end of the movie. And Priscilla has gone to meet Elvis in his dressing room um, just before he's about to do a show to tell him that she's leaving him and she wants a divorce. And she's just told him this and he's, uh, uh, he's not happy about it. Um, okay, you got, the, you got the lines and everything? Yes. You must be out of your mind. You got everything a woman could ever want. I only wanted you, but that was impossible. There's no place for me in your life. <laughs> what? Sorry, go okay. ahead. Okay, let's do, let's do take two. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. I won't look at you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Here, start, start with, with higher energy. Then okay, we can, okay. we can. Okay, okay. Get it going. Okay. You. You must be out of your mind. You got everything a woman could ever want. <laughs> God damn it, Katie. <laughs> I can't help it. I'm campy. I can't help it. I can't help it. I try to be normal. 
I try. I just can't. I'm not normal. I'm weird. I, okay. I try. All right. I don't know what to do with me. No. Can't be. Okay. All right. <laughs> I don't know if we're going to be able to do this. No. I'll do no. Priscilla. I'll do Priscilla. No, 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 no. I can, I can, I can do it. I can bring it home. Okay. All right. Um, here, we'll give ourselves <laughs> a second just to, just to calm down. Okay. <sighs> okay. All right. Okay, I'm going to do um, Liz Taylor. Okay. Doing this <laughs> to Richard Okay. Gordon. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. You must be out of your mind. You got everything a woman could ever want. I only wanted you, but that was impossible. There's no place for me in your life. You have 12 grown men waiting on you. You want me to cook? I can't even get you a glass of water. You press a button for that. You've got thousands of fans out there in that audience, Elvis, and I'm just one of them, an observer. The only place you really want to be is on stage. <sighs> okay. I sneezed. That was I good. got through it. I sneezed. Sorry. I was like, don't fuck it up. I was trying to hold it. And I was like, yeah. it's going to come out. <laughs> uh, but I have to take my mom to physical therapy. Okay. Okay. Um, anyway. Uh, and actually, they, she all, all credit to the actress. She did actually give a very subtle and good uh, delivery of that monologue. Um, and not. She did. Yeah. But. Uh, anyway. You want me to cook? I can't cook. Okay. <laughs> you got three grown men waiting on you all the time. <laughs> that's Betty Davis with the. Uh, that's um, how I would do it. Yeah. I mean, that's that's all. That's I don't. I don't. I. You want me to mm -hmm. cook? Yeah. You press a button for that. Yeah, press um, a button for that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> three. Three grown men waiting on you. It's yeah. Okay. The 12. 12. Um, <laughs> they call you E. They do. Um, or EP. Um, EP phone home. Yeah. Well, All you right. can find, you can follow us on, we have a Twitter or X, as you call it. We have mm. a YouTube, Mother Murder Podca Podcaster, where you can see my looks. Yes. We have a TikTok. And we have an Instagram. Mm -hmm. All Mother Murder Podcaster. Yes. Um, and uh, then, yeah, yeah. So follow us and rate us and all that stuff. And we'll be back soon with another episode. <laughs>